where do we want black lesbians to be in 20 years? We're such an invisible part of the LGBT community. Nobody thinks about us except us, you know? And unless we think about us and take care of us, nobody else is. I'm real clear about that. Real clear about that. Welcome to the Zami Nobla National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging podcast. We are your sound source for Black lesbian history. I'm your host, Angela Denise Davis. Brenda Joyce Crawford is one bad sister. If you know her, you know that's true. And if you don't know her, you're about to know her with this incredible interview she gave us when I visited her in February in Vallejo, California. Of the many things we talk about, Brenda shares information about how cannabis can be helpful to so many individuals. In addition to her work to advocate for cannabis as a resource for wellness, she is a longtime community activist who's been at the forefront of significant activity in the San Francisco Bay Area. So here's my conversation with one righteous sister. My name is Brenda Joyce Crawford, and I am 73 years old, and I show up in the world as a Black lesbian community activist. I have been an activist for well over 50 years, Sometimes I get paid for it, sometimes I don't. But it is what I do and what my purpose in life is all about, is to advocate for folks whose voices are not as quite as loud as mine. Well, thank you for being part of the Zami Noble podcast, as we are on location here in Vallejo, California, uh, not too far from San Francisco in the Greater Bay Area. And you have had, uh, as you said, an extensive history in activism. So we are so excited to have you on the podcast today. Tell me a little bit about where you grew up. Well, I was born in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, my family came from a little town in Mississippi called Yazoo City. Uh, that's where the uh, my uh primary family is from. That's where we all originated from. My mom and uh, her mother later moved to Vaughn, Mississippi, where um, we were sharecroppers. And I spent the first 12 years of my life in Mississippi. Uh, We moved from Vaughn, Mississippi back to Jackson. uh, And I lived there until I was 12. And then my mom got remarried, married a guy who moved to Brooklyn, New York. And uh, after my mom had uh, left Mississippi, maybe a year later, she sent for me. And how did you make your way to the West Coast? Well, um, I lived in Boston, Massachusetts for well over 20 some odd years. And uh Boston was a really hard place to live. I mean, it's a beautiful city. Some folks say that it is racist to the bone. I think it is just old and people are set in their ways, which does sometimes generate racism. But I was in Boston and I I just, it was a hard way to live. It was a hard way of life in Boston. I was in uh, Boston during the days of the Combahee River Collective mm. and uh all those women who were instrumental in the women's movement early on. Uh, And I just decided at one point that I wasn't really happy in Boston. I'll never forget. We had a huge snowstorm. I mean, it was huge. It was a massive nor'easterner, okay? Snow was up to the roof. Dug my car out of, of the snow, had somebody come and dig it out, And by the time I came home, somebody had parked in my parking space. Oh, no. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. I was just (laughs) like, I can't put up with this snow. I can't put up with people parking in my parking space. At the time, heating oil was over a dollar a gallon. And I lived in a house that had a 500-gallon oil tank. 
and 500 gallons would only last a couple of weeks in the middle of the winter. Mm. And so I just decided, let me try California. So I sent out a uh, resume, and I got an interview in a place called Redding, California. Now, the only thing I knew about California was Los Angeles and San Francisco. I had no idea where Redding was, never even heard of it, but it was California. Mm -hmm. And so I I came out for a job interview, and the further we got from San Francisco, the sadder I became. Redding is like way up in the mountains. It's about three hours from San Francisco. No black folks live up there. There are some Native Americans and some Latinos up there, but I saw no black folks. I just It was the only time that I went into an interview in my entire life that I purposely did bad so that they would not offer me that job mm. because I was just really clear that I was not uh, going to live in Redding, California. Uh, came back down here, and it was an interview tour that I was on. Came back down here and got another interview in a little town called Salinas, California, which is really John Steinbeck country, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's farming area. Never been to any place like Salinas in my life. But I was offered a job as director of a pre-release uh, program out of the California Department of Correction. Mm-hmm. They had community-based pre-release programs, and I was offered a job working in one of those. And so I quickly uh, sent back to Massachusetts, got the rest of my clothes, and set up a shop in Salinas, California for about three years until I couldn't stand that anymore, and then eventually made my way to Oakland. And what year was that when you came to Oakland? I think it was 19... 19- 85 or 86. But I had met people in Oakland. So when mm-hmm. I was in Salinas, I used to spend my weekends up in Oakland. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's so special about this area is that there is a very rich history of black lesbian activity in the Bay Area, particularly through the 80s and the 90s when there was a lot of things going on. How have you seen Oakland and the Bay Area change over the years? Well, a lot of the women who were my peers are now older. Some of them are no longer with us. Uh, When I first came out to California in the 80s, I just thought I had died and gone to heaven. There were women everywhere. There were black women everywhere. There was a women's place bookstore. There was mama bears. Uh, There was uh, the Jubilee. There were all of these places where black women just really were, you know, they were large and in charge. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, it was very easy to connect up with black women. And uh, I came out and there was a lot of activism going on. You know, there were consciousness raising groups and there was uh, support groups and there were all kinds of uh, groups that were happening, got involved, uh, and, I, you know, I don't really remember whether Nia was in the 80s or not, but maybe Nia was in the 90s. But I remember that I facilitated the first uh, planning meeting of Nia, which it was a black lesbian collective that put on retreats mm-hmm. every year out at um, in Marin. Uh, and so there were a group of women who got together and decided to organize these retreats where we could go and talk about being black lesbians in the world, do planning and that kind of thing. And I was got involved with them. I've always done kind of organizational development consulting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was able to work with them to plan their retreat. And also um, was I worked with Lizbeth, who I think you all interviewed. Yes. Yes, I was. I organized a planning meeting with Ashe that Lizbeth did back in the day and also worked with them a lot to try and figure out how to broaden the um, dis- distribution of Ache mm-hmm. and uh, never did any of the writing or any of the technical stuff, just really worked with them around operational issues. Mm-hmm. So this was the kind of work that was being done in this very vital, alive, energetic black community where we were putting out our own publications, there was groups that were established that we could go in and, and support each other and whatever the issues were. Um, and 
I just thought, again, thought I had died and gone to heaven. Mm -hmm. Oakland, California in the 80s and 90s and in the 70s was the place to be. Sometimes when I talk to activists, I'm always curious about where the seed of that activism began in their lives. Some people will mark uh, an early childhood incident or something that later developed in their young adulthood. At what point did you understand that activism was going to be something that was the pulse of your life force? You know, it's an interesting question. My mom used to tell the story about when I was growing up as a child in Mississippi, uh, she'd see me out in the backyard playing and I'd have like a box that I would stand on and I would be pretending to give speeches. You know, uh, it was my imaginary friends and my imaginary audience at the time. I don't, I mean, I think that my activism came from just really recognizing that if I didn't fight for me, nobody else would. Mm. And I think I learned that early on in life. Uh, as a result of a, you know, a lot of childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And I think that trauma really uh, motivated me to become active. And I remember that when I was in um, elementary school, uh, trying to organize the kids to uh, stand up against some policy that the school had passed. And it was a segregated school. And, you know, and these little black kids, we were... I don't even remember what the issue was, but I do remember going around and telling people, we don't have to stand for this. We can fight. We can fight. Of course, nobody fought. And I, of course, got my butt beat by my mom for going around instigating things because the teacher called her and told her. But um, I really do think that my activism was born out of uh, some early childhood experiences. In addition to your work with Nia, what other ways... Were you active in the black lesbian community in the Bay Area? Well, I always have uh, worked in areas that I felt needed the attention that other people had not uh, come to terms with yet. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that in the 80s when I came here, there was just such a rich variety of activities to get involved in. Mm -hmm that I, it was like a kid in a candy store. You had your choices of activities to be involved in. And I always got involved with increasing the visibility of black lesbians. That was always my primary focus, and it still is today, increasing the visibility and the clout and the power of black lesbians to control our own lives. And so all of my work has been around that. From the time I, when I was 40 and organized the African-American Lesbian 40-plus group that lasted for a very long time, uh, somewhere between leaving New York and coming to California, I managed to get sober. You know, I was in AA for a long time. I still am in AA, been sober now for going on 37 years. Uh, but even in that arena, organized the first African-American LGBT AA group in Oakland, mm. you know, that still goes on today. It's mm. still there today. Uh, but that was one of the things that I did. Uh, also, at the time, there were lots of social engagements. Uh, I remember that newspaper called Plexus that was put out by the lesbian community in Oakland. And I didn't really do anything. I didn't contribute. I wasn't a writer. I've never been a writer. But I was one of the people who made sure that the newsletter got out and that it was distributed to people. So, you know, I would help my friend Vivian with distribution of it. And Plexus was out in, I think, the early 80s. It, it, it sort of was before the gay news, gay community news or the Bay Times. And it was one of these things where people actually just sat down and typed it up. And it was very, very homemade, very grassroots. But Plexus was a source of information for black lesbians in terms of, or lesbians in general, in terms of how we communicated. I'm fascinated by these 
publications like Plexus and Ashe, A Woman in the Life in D.C. Right. With, with Sheila Alexander-Reed, because they seem to be a real opportunity to share information and to galvanize the community. And I almost lament that we don't have something like that now. And, and maybe what we're doing with podcasting and blogging and, and things like that has taken its place, but there seems to be a very rich archive of history with these sort of publications. Yeah, there is. I remember, and it was certainly not a black lesbian publication, but at a point in my life, I remember reading The Wishing Well. Uh, and I even advertised in The Wishing Well looking for a girlfriend. You know, it was the place that you put your ads in if you wanted to find a partner. So Was uh, that a local publication? No, it was out of Vermont or someplace like that. Wow. It, yeah. It was it was one of the first lesbian publications around. Uh, and it was by a black woman and I think a white woman created it. And it was a place where lesbians sent in stories. And so I would get wishing well and, you know, look at the personal ad and read the articles and that kind of thing. But you're right. There was a really rich source of information before the Internet. You know, mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. the Internet has impacted our ability to have, you know, hard copies of writings of lesbians that we took with us everywhere to mm -hmm. reinforce and make sure that folks knew that we existed. For me, it was my confirmation that I was not in this world alone, mm -hmm. that there were other women out there who felt just as strongly about being a lesbian, about being an open lesbian as I did. Mm -hmm. so. You mentioned the After 40 group. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, that, it's funny how that happened. Uh, I remember one day, I was living in Oakland at the time, and I had this whole day planned of activities that I was going to do. It's still there today, but I remember I was going to get up and go to the Berkeley flea market that mm -hmm. happens on Saturday, and then I was going to go get my car washed, and I was going to do some other things, and then halfway in the day, I got really tired, and I had to take a nap, you know, and I couldn't figure out why I was so tired. And then I got up and I looked in the mirror and I said, you're tired because you're getting old. <laughs> you're getting old. That's why you're tired. Uh, and then I, I thought, well, I need to organize some other women who feel the same way I do. Uh, a friend of mine who's no longer um, with us anymore, her name is Carol Charlotte. Carol Charlo lived right around the corner from me. She was a, a, a lesbian and she was actually one of the first plumbers that the city of San Francisco hired. Mm. Carol worked for the school department in the city of San Francisco. Carol lived right around the corner from me. And I went around to Carol's apartment. I said, you know, girl, I got tired. We're getting old. I think we need to organize some older sisters to talk about <laughs> this aging thing, you know? And Carol said, well, that sounds good to me. And we organized uh, 40 plus. And the first meeting, there were 10 or 12 women who showed up. Mm -hmm. And all we're talking about getting older as black lesbians. And we mm. just continued to meet. We would meet once a month at different people's houses. It grew so big at one point, we had a chapter down in L.A. that wow. had uh, probably 50, 60 women. And the Bay Area chapter had 50, 60 women. There were lots of stumbles in the beginning because nobody really knew the principles of sound organizing. Nobody knew that. All we wanted to do was get together, share food, and, and be supportive as we age. So, you know, we made some missteps and some folks got hurt. One of the rules should have been that we don't date anybody in the 40 plus because the <laughs> dating thing is what really kind of got us. You know, women came in there and they would date each other and then they break up and mm -hmm. then... You know, one of them wouldn't come back to the meeting and then somebody else would start dating the one that just broke up. And so it just came, became a mess, you know. But the good part of it was that it was the first time that a group of African-American lesbians, we were very clear about that. We used to also fight about trying to maintain the space for African-American lesbians. I don't see that as difficult as it used to be. It used mm -hmm. to be really difficult to maintain our space, mm -hmm. to make sure that we said, this is African-American lesbian space, and uh, we're not ashamed of that, and we're going to fight to maintain that. 
it, that was difficult back in that day, in the days when, uh, in the 70s and, and early 80s. But uh, today it doesn't seem quite that difficult. It seems like people are really sort of comfortable uh, maintaining their spaces based on their race. And, and, you know, we all need to be able to speak freely about how we experience the world. But the 40 plus was a very, very powerful group at one point. Uh, what it was this lifespan? 10, 12, 15 years. Wow. 20 years. It lasted for a very, I tell you what, it lasted long enough for nobody to be 40 in there anymore. Okay. <laughs> We were, people were 60 and, and, and I don't know about 70, but people were certainly over 50 and going into their 60s Mm -hmm. Uh, and not just early 60s and 70s, middle. And um, we would get women from as far as Sacramento to come down to Oakland. Mm. Uh, And so it, it, it had a very powerful presence. And up until maybe... Three or four years ago, they used to do the anniversary of its founding every year. And I think the last one was three or four years ago. So most of the women now, I got an invitation from a woman who was one of the original founders. She just turned 80. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, last year was it, Terry? Yeah, turned 80 years old. So so you've been dealing with uh, aging issues and black lesbians aging for a very long time. Ever since you're, right. You're not new at this. No. Now, as soon as I turned 40, Mm -hmm. it became really clear that my life was changing, that I was getting older, and that I needed to focus on how we take care of ourselves as we age, both emotionally, physically, and certainly politically. Mm -hmm. It It becomes really more important to become politically engaged the older you get. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so yeah, for a very long time, you Mm -hmm. know, and if I have to say, Anything about the foundation of my work uh, over my lifespan, it really came into being when I was in my 40s. Before I turned 40, I did a lot of things. I mean, I sort of did a lot of things on the surface, but I was really able to focus once I turned 40 on the issues of black lesbian aging. What's the joys of being an older black lesbian? Oh, girl, you get to say whatever you want. You don't (laughs) give a damn about what nobody thinks, (laughs) you know? You just get to tell them off, you Mm -hmm. know? If you Mm -hmm. don't like it, you ain't paying my rent. I'm not going to bed with you. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you think. No, not really. But (laughs) but, um, the joy of getting older is really... You know, you're more, I am more secure in who I am as a human being, Mm. you know? Uh, I think there was lots of self-obsession when I was younger. Make sure that my hair was right. Make sure that my clothes were right. All of the kind of self-obsessed issues that you deal with that, you know, just keep you from being who you truly are. And when I, as I get older now, if my socks don't match, oh, well, my feet are covered. (laughs) <laughs> you know my feet are covered mm-hmm. i'm not i don't have cold feet so mm-hmm. that's what that's the object it ain't around fashion and flashing and styling anymore it's around mm-hmm. comfort mm-hmm. um i also think that um you've had i've had some experience in my life that have created i think for me a body of wisdom that i don't take for granted my wisdom was hard fought for you know, it has been difficult to achieve. Not always, well, I, I don't know if I'm not wise today, but I do think I make wiser choices today than I did when I was younger. I think the arrogance of youth is something that I don't miss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I do not miss mm-hmm. the arrogance of youth. I adore the wisdom and the stability of aging. Mm-hmm. As you look around at your community of aging black lesbians, what are some major issues that we need to uh, have at the forefront and be concerned about? Isolation. Isolation. That is the biggest killer of us is isolation. Being isolated affects us much more than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's just as deadly as that. And so if I can do nothing else in my life, I want to always be preaching about community and diminishing isolation and increasing social engagement. 
Uh, we need to be in touch. Uh, I heard Marianne say this today that no black lesbian in this country should be growing older alone. And I, I truly believe that. Whether it's through a warm line or through some sort of internet setting or whatever we do, we need to reach out and make sure that our sisters who are in Arkansas or wherever the heck they are that are not, you know, the center of large uh, LGBT communities, that those folks have access to diminish isolation. It really is a killer. Hmm. It is a real killer. How do we combat isolation? By building community, by making sure that we look at all of the options that are available to us. We have great technology. A lot of our older folks are not you know, as skilled with technology as some of the younger ones are, but we can provide the kind of lessons that would uh, allow people to increase their technological skills. But I think that we do it by uh, making sure that there are places like uh, Zami Nobla is, uh, you know, it's one of the best things that ever happened for black lesbian. I want every black lesbian, older black lesbian in this country to know about it. I want them to sign up on the Facebook. I want them to listen to the podcast. I want them to join the book club. There are so many things that we can do to create community when we're living in separate states. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, technology today eliminates those geographical boundaries and we can, we can create all kinds of ways for folks to be in touch. That is why I absolutely adore Zami Nobla, and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that the word gets out about it, at least in the Bay Area. And we're excited about your excitement because uh, a little bird told me that we're even looking at a chapter being developed here in the area. We are. And this is exciting um, because... uh, Women like you with your wit and wisdom will really help other black lesbians who are aging, combat isolation, build community, and find resources. One uh, resource that I am excited to talk to you about because you are very active around that is Seniors in Cannabis. Right. The... Seniors are the fasting, fastest growing new users of cannabis in the country today. And we're doing it because as we get older, doctors keep pushing pills on us. You know, there are some seniors who take eight and 10 pills a day. I was one of those, uh, you know, have suffered from uh, low grade anxiety most of my life, have had insomnia most of my life. Uh, have suffered from chronic pain as a result of rheumatoid arthritis and some surgeries I've had on my back. And so at at a point where I was taking, I think it was like eight pills a day, um, I just decided I need to do something else, something, there had to be a better way. Mm -hmm. So I started investigating cannabis uh, and found that the cannabis could take the place of the Ambion that I was taking at night to sleep. And I didn't have to fear that I was going to get up and get in my car and drive somewhere or go have a full course meal under the influence (laughs) of Ambien and not even know it. Mm -hmm. I could take, you know, I could put a couple of drops of THC tincture on my tongue at night and have a restful sleep. The other part that I thought about was the pain, you know, using the bombs and the creams for the inflammation that I have as a result of the uh, rheumatoid arthritis. But cannabis allows for seniors to make informed choices about the medication that they take. And it can be substituted for a lot of the toxic poisonous medication that doctors give you for a natural herb that doesn't do anything to you except make you better. Mm. Now, I know that there's lots of stigma about cannabis out there, and it's the drug of the 60s and You know, everybody talking about getting high. I don't get high. I get relaxed. But if I wanted to get high, I could, you know, and I would. Uh, And it's no worse than y'all having a couple of glasses of wine and I don't drink. Uh, But 
you know, I use cannabis because of its natural healing effects and how it is complementary to my aging process. Mm. When I was using uh, pharmaceuticals, they were not complementary to my aging process. I sat on my couch and nodded out for like eight hours a day because I was on heavy duty pain killers. The doctor had ordered um, 50 milligrams of this pain medication twice a day. And that was 100 milligrams of, of uh, opioids that I was taking. And not only did it mess with my digestive system, but it immobilized me. It had me sitting on my couch, drooling on my T-shirt, you know. And I just thought I didn't retire to do this. I just did not retire to be immobilized by poisonous pharmaceutical medication. Just not going to do it. And so then I went on a search for alternatives and discovered cannabis and have been blessed to be with a group of women called the Compassionate Growers of Vallejo. Mm -hmm. And it is a bunch of old women and some old men now. And we get together and we grow our own because it's legal here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's expensive in the uh, dispensary, although we do, some of us go to dispensaries. But it's like our own garden club. Uh, it's about springtime now. We'll start trading seeds and talking about the different strands. And, wow. And uh, we also have a group that cooks with cannabis. Uh, we have a group that creates art with cannabis, all seniors. And we do it because it improves the quality of our lives. Mm -hmm. There is no way that somebody who is in their 70s should be taking eight, 10 pills a day mm -hmm. and taking a pill to, to make up for what the other pill is not doing. Mm -hmm. Today, I have a pill that I take for high blood pressure, and high cholesterol, and that's it. That's what I take. Uh, you know, I have a family history of high cholesterol and high blood pressure, mm -hmm. so I take it as a precaution. Some people, when the conversation of cannabis comes up, uh, may be confused, CBD, THC, ABC. Uh, there's not a, a real understanding for some people about what we mean when we say cannabis. Help, help us break some of that down. All right. Well, so CBD is one of the basic elements of cannabis, and CBD has been proven to be a really effective pain reliever and anxiety. And it also ca it can also uh, help you to sleep by relaxing the muscles and that kind of thing. THC is the uh, euphoria part of the plant that you can, when you ingest THC, you're going to get, you're going to have a buzz, but it is no greater than the buzz you have from drinking a glass of wine. I don't smoke a lot because I have a compromised respiratory system. So I don't smoke a lot, but I do drink and I do eat and I do rub cannabis on my body and I use it uh, every day and I am a big proponent of it. In fact, one of the things that I would like to do, my last uh, hurrah in this world, I would like to open up a cannabis education and dispensary for seniors right here in Vallejo. Hmm. There's one that just opened up in Berkeley, the first one in the country that is strictly designed for seniors. And it was opened up by a woman named Sue Taylor, who is an ex-Catholic uh, school uh, principal. And Sue Taylor got involved in it because, you know, her son had told her about it. And she was also using lots of prescription drugs and mm -hmm. decided to try something different. Well, thanks for that clarification, because I think some people think if they get CBD and oil or cream or they put on their body, oh, I'm afraid because I may get high and I don't want to get high. And there's there's a, some people can get really confused with that. Right. No. So CBD is the part of the cannabis plant that doesn't cause the euphoria. THC causes euphoria. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing wrong mm -hmm. be, with being euphoric every once in a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what type of activism around cannabis are you involved in? Because I know you're a real proponent, proponent of this and it's, it's obviously made a great difference for you in your daily life. Really just around trying to uh, decrease the stigma and mm -hmm. encourage more seniors to um, uh, 
try it as opposed to pharmaceuticals. One of the things that we're doing is this spring, we're going to be organizing senior trips up to all of the uh, grow areas up in the Emerald Triangle, which is the part of California where a lot of cannabis is grown up in the Mendocino, Sonoma County area. So we'll be taking trips up there. We've done educational sessions in town uh, around uh, developing ways in which people can interact while using cannabis. Also have gone into nursing homes and retirement homes not so much nursing home, retirement homes mm-hmm. primarily, and done education on cannabis. So I do kind of cannabis 101. I've done that at senior retirement homes, and I'm going to continue to do that. Uh, and when we do that, we always come in with little samples that we uh, give people, and it could be something uh, as simple as a cream or a balm to rub on the hands if they're having uh, aches and pains. And people really seem to enjoy uh, learning more about it. And again, seniors are the fastest growing market. There are millions of us in this country and where it's legal, specifically here in California, mm-hmm. their seniors are uh, running into the dispensaries. This resource is not available to everyone across the country. Right. And so all of the positive changes that you've seen in your life by using cannabis as opposed to some of these heavy-duty pharmaceuticals uh, is not available. Right. And it also, it's also a part of the drugs company's uh, campaign to keep putting out poison drugs that do not do anything but... Uh, exacerbate whatever the issues are that we're dealing with. So mm-hmm. uh, it is, uh, I think it's purposeful on their part. I also though think that people can get CBD any place. It's legal in every state. So if people want to try CBD, I would really encourage them to do that as a first step into getting into the cannabis world. Mm-hmm. CBD comes from hemp too. The hemp CBD in my personal opinion, is not as effective as the uh, uh, cannabis CBD. Mm. As cannabis CBD, for me, works better. Some people, hemp works better, mm. but cannabis works better for me. We've talked about a lot, your activism um, and the ways in which you've been shaped by this community as, as well as the ways in which you've shaped this community. As you think about the joy of being an older lesbian uh, at this point in time in your life. What are you thinking about for the future? What do you want to see in terms of your continued activism? You know, I'm at a point in my life where I would really like to work with young people to pass it on. You know, I mean, I know that there are is activism today, but it's not the kind of activism that I'm accustomed to. I mean, I I really think direct action, uh, grassroots organizing, uh, getting out and really getting up close and personal with people when you're trying to promote change is the best way to do that. And so I would like to have an opportunity to talk to young black lesbians about the way it was. And maybe they don't wanna hear that, but I think there's valuable lessons in talking about the way it was. And and from that, we can talk about the way it can be, Mm. you know? I mean, I don't know how it can be because I'm only back talking about the way it was and I'm working on the way it is right now. So I don't think I'm going to live long enough to see the way it will be. But I would like to be able to meet with folks to talk about that. What is it that we want for our lives in 20 years? Where do we want black lesbians to be in 20 years? We're such an invisible part of the LGBT community. Nobody thinks about us except us, Mm. you know? And unless we think about us and take care of us, nobody else is. Mm -hmm. I'm real clear about Mm -hmm. that. Real clear about that. I'm real clear that there is not a place for me as a 73-year-old black lesbian in the city of Vallejo to go into a retirement community and feel comfortable. Mm. without somebody coming back in there and, you know, throwing holy water and trying to bless me and all the rest of that crap. But, um, you know, and it's not that I'm not spiritual, I am. But I um, think that as I get older, the thing that I constantly have to fight is uh, 
to make sure that my fears don't take over me. Mm. Getting older, I've heard a lot of folks say getting older is not for for any weak of heart, you mm -hmm. know, and it really isn't. I mean, there's so many things that you become vulnerable as the older you get, and you have to constantly fight against fear and know that you can get up and you can go do that. It doesn't matter if you're walking with a cane, doesn't matter if, you know, your knees are stiff or you're in pain, just go out and do, just get in folks' face, you know, that's, and not, not everybody has that kind of direct form of activism the way I do, but um, it is really important for us not to get in, give in to our fears. Mm -hmm. That's what has caused a great many of us to go back into the closet. Mm -hmm. And the closet is a deadly place for us to be. It's just deadly. What are some of those fears that you have to hold at bay? Uh, fear of vulnerability, physical vulnerability. You know, I find myself when I get out of my car at night looking around, making sure nobody is on my street because I walk slower now. You know, I have a cane. My mobility is not as great as it used to be. Um, that is a fear, the fear of vulnerability. Also, the fear, I think a lot of older people have been um, stigmatized and sort of marginalized around, you know, just kind of patter on the head kind of thing. My fear of not being taken seriously, you know? Mm. Uh, if you come from a place where you've been really powerful all your life and you've been banging on tables and jumping up in people's faces, when you get older, people sort of look like, oh, that's just, you know, poo, poo, poo. That's just... That's just little old Brenda doing what little old Brenda does instead of that's Brenda with a legitimate complaint that needs to be paid attention to. Mm -hmm. People, you know, marginalize us as we get older. You know, nothing infuriates me more than that. That's ageism. Mm -hmm. That's classic definition of ageism. So I think we need to fight against that. I remember a young person telling a, an elder in the LGBT community, you know, this is not my grandfather's uh, fight, you know, as if uh, to say this is a new day, not even realizing the connection, the legacy of activism. And there was something very sad about, about hearing that that person would think that he or she was so disconnected right. from the legacy of struggle. Right, right. And, you know, I think that there is a lack of knowledge about that legacy of struggle and about where they are, they are currently at because of that legacy of struggle. Now, I don't want anybody to constantly be saying thank you, but I don't want anybody to be saying going away, go away either, because you're standing in that space because of the legacy of struggle that me and a lot of other folks were involved in. And you need to recognize, I mean, you know, I, I just think that there's a disconnect between young and old. I go on the internet sometimes and I'll write something on the internet and some young person inevitably will be trying to reprimand me about something I'm saying. And I just want to say, you know, child, please go sit down, you know, go sit down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, don't, I mean, I've been doing this stuff for 50 years before mm -hmm. you were even a gleam in your daddy's eye. Come mm -hmm. on, sit down. Don't mm -hmm. talk to me like that. Um, take a chair, take two chairs, take two chairs, you know, just sit down, just go away, you know? <laughs> um, and I think that folks really don't understand the hard fought battles that we, we have endured the LGBT folks who are in their seventies and eighties. Yeah. I came out during the time where, um, uh, it was illegal. I mean, you know, you could get killed if you were walking down the street with your partner. I can remember being beat up in a bar because I was going with the bar maid at the time is what they called them. And she was my girlfriend. And this was in New York. And I went in and she said something to me. And there was some man who wanted to get next to her. And she said, oh, you can't get next to me. I'm with her. And he turned around and just jumped all over me, just you know, mm. brutally assaulted me because I was a lesbian and I was in love with a, a, a black woman who was in love with me. So I don't know that people recognize those kinds of things mm -hmm. that happened when we were in our uh, early, late teens and 20s. Mm. Um, and 
the fact that it has not always been okay for folks to walk down the street holding hands. Mm -hmm. It's not okay in some places today, but it's a lot more acceptable for same-sex people to hold hands today than it was in my generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, my friend, you know, that's how we refer to our folks as my friend, Mm -hmm. Uh, not my partner or my wife or whatever. And so I just think that we need to start having those conversations for a lot of us who are, in our 60s, 70s, and 80s, leave this world. Because we have some valuable stuff we can tell. I'm always telling Marianne, I want a conference. I want a gathering, Mm -hmm. Marianne. I want a family reunion, Mm -hmm. you know? I want a family Mm -hmm. reunion of old lesbians and young lesbians, Mm -hmm. black lesbians, so we can talk. And we can, you know, it's about this is who we are, and this is who we need to be, and this is where we're going. I would really like for us to have that conversation. Well, as we give shape and and put that out in the universe that we will have such a family reunion and that type of conversation, uh, what would you, two-pronged question, what would you say in that conversation to young black lesbian activists? That's the first question. And the second question is, because I think another part of the conversation is speaking to our peers. What would you say to older black lesbians? Well, I would tell older black lesbians that uh, we need to do everything we can to remain active and to remain engaged in the struggle, you know. Uh, And we need to continue to walk the road that we've been walking uh, for as many years as we have. And for younger lesbians, I would say, I just want to have a discussion with you around what it was like. And I want to know what it's like for you today. I really want to, I don't know what it's like for younger lesbians today. Mm. You know, I really don't. Um, I know that there seems to be this kind of new sense of freedom that younger lesbians have than I had as a young lesbian. But in terms of what is their daily reality, I don't know what the daily reality of a young African-American lesbian is. I would like to know that. I do know that uh, we had a young black lesbian who was uh, a student here in the city of Vallejo who went to school here and uh, was harassed uh, to the point where her family moved. Now, I don't know whether this contributed to it, but shortly after her family moved, she killed herself. Mm. So, um, and again, I don't know if that's directly attributed to the bullying she got in school or not, but... I would like to know what life is like for them. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I can tell them what life is like for me. Mm. And then maybe somewhere we can get a kind of meeting of the mind and figure out how we can develop this blended community Mm -hmm. that takes care of her as she's in her younger years and takes care of me as I age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always love seeing you on Facebook and in the Zami Nobla Facebook group. You always bring such uh, levity and wisdom to situations. So I am deeply honored to sit with you today and to capture um, this interview for our listeners. Um, The question I always ask our guests, because I know there is probably something I left out and all that we talked about, and there's so much that you've done here in this area. Uh, Is there uh, something else you think our listeners should know? Is there something I left out? Is there a question you wish I had asked? What? What's the final word? Well, the final word is, I think, for me, is that... uh, I think that we just need to do everything that we can to reinforce the sense of community. That was the thing that was uh, really wonderful back in the 60s and the 70s and early 80s, was there was a real sense of community among black lesbians. Mm. And that was when we had all of these various organizations. Now Zami Nobla is the only one that's focusing in on older black lesbians. I always identify myself as a pre-women's movement, pre-Stonewall movement out dyke. I've been out for a long time, Mm -hmm. you know? And um, I think 
not everyone has chosen that path to be out, but whatever path that you've chosen, we need to support you on that path Mm -hmm. as you travel it. Mm -hmm. And I would like to do the same thing with young lesbians as well as old lesbians. Brenda Joyce Crawford, thank you for being so committed to your path and for being part of our Black Lesbian history. Thank you so much. Thank you. Brenda is bad, ain't she? I told you, I told you. Not to be surprised. I tell no lies. Brenda's bad. It is so important for us to be informed about resources that can help change our lives and promote wellness. Hats off to you, Brenda, and all the work you're doing in California. And for our listeners today, thanks for being part of a conversation. As always, be safe and have a sweet one. 